Hey, what's up, avid readers? <laughs> so I randomly got a book from the library called Lemon. I'm looking at myself like, are you trying to be uh, funny or something? Totally kidding, guys. We all do this, talk about ourselves and put ourselves down. Not everybody, but some people deal with it, you know? I don't always second guess your thoughts. It'll drive you mad, you know? But this book is supposed to be some sort of high school murder mystery. I didn't bother reading the back, but this was in South Korean. I guess it's like for like it's a it's a it says no arrival i don't know it's like these, a lot of these books are well this one a lot of books are for what like a young kid someone's journey you know anybody could read them but a lot of them have, a lot of the main characters of, book, of stories are they're young young people i think i'll come across some like old man ones old men go through things in life too there has to be books like that somewhere but now that I read the contents of this book, I think there's a bunch of small, short stories in here. Because, and usually when they do that, they'll name like the most popular poem or the most popular short story. They'll name it after that particular, you know, they'll name the whole entire book. Maybe if they have to title it, you know, but they also title their, uh, their um, short stories. They're not short stories, but their table of contents. Yeah, I know I look cool with my glasses on. I'm telling myself that because I'm always looking at myself like, are you doing the right thing, this and that, you know? Anyway, so I'm giving you guys another a good book. I can actually probably read this one a lot faster than any of these other books. So I'm going to read as fast as I can because I'm right here in the parking lot of where I ate some Del Taco. I hope everything goes well. I'm not in no trouble, but I'm pretty freaking stoned. And, um, like I said, I'm in a parking lot of a, a food establishment. I don't want to seem sketch, you know. But this first chapter is called Shorts. Shorts, comma, 2002. I imagine what happened inside one police interrogation room so many years ago. By imagine, I don't mean event, but it's not like I actually there. Not, but it's not like I was actually there, so I don't know what else to call it. I pictured the scene from that day based on what he told me and some other clues. My own experience and conclusions is not just this scene I can I imagine. For over 16 years, I've pondered, prodded, and worked every detail embroiled in the case known as the high school beauty murder. To the point I often fool myself into thinking I personally witnessed the circumstances now stamped on my mind's eye. Imagine, the imagination just as painful as reality. You no, know, it's more painful. After all, what you can imagine has no limit or end. The boy sat alone in the interrogation room for over 10 minutes. The room was bare apart from a table and four chairs. No pictures decorated the wall, no flower, vase, or ashtray sat on the table. Some people appear uneasy no matter what they do, and this boy was one of them. He sat awkwardly in his chair with eyes dull and sleepy looking. Maybe because there was nothing to look at, but his eyes were like camera lenses constantly shifting to find focus on a white background. A detective entered the room and sat across from the boy. The boy's gaze grew a bit more focused. Han Manu, the detective snapped in a tone used by a teacher or head disciplinarian to summon a troublemaker before dealing out punishment. It was enough for resentment to take root in the boy's heart. I believe this was also the moment his cruel fate was sealed. At the time, no one at school called him by his actual name. The other students called him Halmangu or Manu Jol, but this most shiny nickname came from the song Hano Beg Nian. The translation of Halmangu is Hag and Manu Jiol is April Fool's Day. Han O Bag Nian is a famous Korean folk song translated as 500 Years Sorrow. The song became a big hit when singer Cho Young Peel released it in a 1979 debut album. 500 Years Sorrow. To, to their ears, the opening words, Ha Mai Un sounded just like his name if you slurred the end sound so that you said ha an man u or ha ha an man u instead it was perfect this particular nickname proved so popular that both hal mangu and manu jiol died out eventually and his friends would belt out ha an man u like a master pansori singer warming up her voice before a performance, but until the incident, I wasn't even aware of his existence. He was in his last year of senior high and I just entered the school. 
When I groped through my memory, though, I seemed to recall boys warbling his name in a ridiculous, plaintive way in the halls. It meant no harm or disrespect. After the incident, the nickname stopped altogether. No one called him anything. There was no need. I sometimes try calling him the old way. Ha an man u. This life full of misery, as the lyrics say. Then I start wondering if this miserable life has any meaning. I don't mean life in an abstract or general sense, but the life of an actual person. Did the pages of his life hold any meaning? Probably not. At least that's what I believe. Life has no special meaning, not his, not my sister's, not even mine. Even if you try desperately to find it, to contrive some kind of meaning, what's not there isn't there. Life begins without reason and ends without reason. <clears throat> the detective told the boy to listen carefully. This was different from the last time. He needed to think carefully before answering it. Answering. If not, things wouldn't go well from the detective's face was curiously blank. Though the boy wasn't the brightest kid on the block, he could sense the older man had become more frightening than he'd been at the initial questioning. He seethed with something and anything seething like that was to be feared. Let's start by reviewing your statement from last time on June 30th, 2002, around 1800. The detective said punctuating his words by pressing the tip of his ballpoint pen carefully on the table. That is around six o'clock in the afternoon. You were on your scooter on your way to a chicken delivery when you passed the car being driven by Shin Jiang Jun, correct? No, no, the detective's gaze skimmed the document and shot back up. Well, that's what your statement says. I wasn't on my way to a delivery, I was on my way back. An inconsequential detail, the detective looked down once more. Then why does it say here you were going to a delivery? Fine, whatever, so you were on your way back when you passed the car that Shin Jiang Yun was driving, correct? Yes, what kind of car did you say it was? Pardon me? The car model, he was sure the boy was just pretending not to understand. What kind of car was he driving? I'm not sure, but I think it was dark gray and shiny. Didn't I mention all this last time? Oh, I told you we're going over your statement. So a shiny, dark gray car. Yes, like this? The detective pulled out a photo from the file. The boy leaned forward, peered out a photo, and looked up. I don't know, maybe. Even if it wasn't the exact one, would you say it was the same kind, an SUV? The boy studied the photo once more and looked up at the detective. I think so. For the last time, was it an SUV or not? Yes, okay, you're doing good. The detective pulled out another photo. The boy looked at it and then at the detective's face. Is this your scooter? Is this your scooter? The detective asked. The boy responded immediately that it was good. The detective rifled through the pages of the file, delaying the moment of the decisive blow. Now for the important part, you said you saw Kim Hae An sitting in the passenger seat of Shin Jiang Yoon Jun's car, correct? Yes. And what did you say again about her hair and her clothes? Her hair was down. You mean it was loose, not tied up? Yes. And what was she wearing? Um, she was in a tank top and shorts. A tank top and shorts. Well, that's what I... What you remember? So what color? Color her clothes, the detective barked, thinking idiots like this never give a straight answer. What color were they? I don't know. You don't remember? Well, I'm not too sure. You know, she was in a tank top and shorts, but you don't know what color? You think that makes sense? But I swear I don't know. The boy was hiding something. The detective wondered at the time had finally come to nab him. Right then, the boy glanced around the room. What's the matter? The detective asked. I'm gonna have to go. What? Do you know what time it is? I have to go to work. The boy placed his hands on the table as if he meant to get up. The detective glared at him in silence. What did he think then? Did he think, got you, asshole? Was it then that he became convinced of the boy's guilt? Or did he glance at the boy's hands on the table and try to determine if they were capable of clutching something like a brick or rock and bringing it down on someone's head? He might have thought with the shake of his head. Hmm, those hands do look tougher than Shin Jiang Jun's. Not that you need a whole lot of power to bash in the small head of a girl with smooth, glossy hair. If anything, Shin Jiang Jun was taller with a body hardened by sports, while Han Manu was rather small and average of height. The detective cleared his throat and told the boy to pay attention. Your statement doesn't add up. Look here. He turned the photos around and faced the boy and proceeded to explain. Shin Jiang Jun wasn't driving just any car, but a Lexus RX 300. The seat height of an SUV is higher than that of an average sedan, which means that somehow height is also higher. But if you're sitting on a scooter, you wouldn't be at eye level with the window of an SUV or even slightly lower. The detective asked if he knew what all this meant. The boy didn't respond. The detective was kind enough to spell it out for him. What I'm saying is from your stumpy little scooter, uh, it would have been physically impossible to see if Kim High on a uh, Kim Hayon was wearing shorts or jeans so he said but he wasn't completely sure it wasn't just a hunch but when he saw the shock on the boy's face the detective knew it was time to go in for the kill therefore he didn't actually see Kim Hayon in Shin Jiang's car he saw her out of it that's how you knew she was wearing shorts you saw Shin dropping her off or you saw her walking by herself after he dropped her off either way you never saw her sitting in the passenger seat if we followed that logic the boy blinked several times though he heard what the detective was saying he didn't seem to comprehend the situation he was in 
On the detective's lips hovered the nervous smile of one who was about to land a fatal blow. The last person to see Kim Hae-on wasn't Shin Jeong Joon, but you. Do you understand what I'm saying? The boy could only stare. Once again, the detective got the sense that the boy was feigning ignorance. He needed to come out a lot stronger. What I'm saying is you're the prime suspect. You killed Kim Hae-on. You struck her with a blunt object and killed her. Me? The boy cried with a shudder. But why? The boy who appeared awkward no matter what he did seemed as if he was... If you were acting, the detective became convinced the imbecile couldn't do anything right. Weren't you listening? You killed Kim Hae-on and then tried to pin it on Shin ji on jun passing yourself off as a witness. Isn't that right? No, of course not. Why would I do that? Why would I kill her? How would I know? You tell me. But I never even spoken to Hae-on. She hardly said a word. Say so. Everyone. She's never answered you even when you talked to her. Not that I've ever tried or anything. What the boy said was true. But I've never even spoken to Hae-on. She hardly said a word. Says who? Everyone. She's never answered you even when you talked to her. Not that I ever tried her or anything. What the boy said was true, but the detective had zero interest in these seemingly irrelevant details. What hogwash is this? Didn't you say she was in shorts? Didn't you see her in them? Tell me how that's possible. The detective leaned across the table. He wondered how the fool was going to get himself out of this one. I don't know, the boy mumbled. But the detective, intoxicated by a sense of victory, was unable to hear the rest of what he said. Well, you don't know now. You're changing your tune. I'm not saying that. No, I think maybe uh, maybe somebody else saw it too. Somebody else. The boy closed his mouth. He no longer felt like talking. In fact, he was wishing he could take back what he just said. I don't think you grasp the seriousness of your situation. You're not going to weasel your way out of this. Until now, you said you were the only one who saw Kim Hae-on. So what the hell do you mean by somebody else? I never said I was the only one who saw her. You never said that? Fine, then who else? Do I have to say I really don't want to? I knew wouldn't have wanted to tell. He would have hated to bring her up. He would have recalled the warmth of her body from that day as she sat lightly pressed up against his back, recalling the sensation he might have grinned like an idiot before the detective, just as he had done with me. Have you lost your freaking mind? The detective wanted to smack the boy's ugly long face that, that resembled a pickle. You think this is a joke? You realize you're contradicting yourself, don't you? You better fess up. Who else saw Kim Hae-on? The boy's upper lip twitched. Um, the detective leaned closer. Someone with the last name of Um? Um, I gotta go, really. The detective felt his energy drain from him. The boy was absolutely manning with an uncanny knack for getting under his skin. Or with an uncanny knack, knack for getting under his skin. Was something really the matter with him? Or was he only pretending to be stupid? You're not leaving until you tell me the truth. I don't care if it takes all night. I don't care if it takes forever. But my boss needs me. I really have to go. Who else saw? The boy mumbled something under his breath. Speak up, the detective roared. It was a uh, Tarim, he said, a fleck of spittle flying out of his mouth. Tarim, Yoon, Yoon Tarim. Who the hell's Yoon Tarim? From Division 3, the same class as Heon, and this Tarim is female. Confusion passed over the boy's face, of course. Division 3 is a girl's class? He didn't ask. Uh, confusion passed over the boy's face, of course. Division 3 is a girl's class. How in the world was he supposed to know that? He didn't realize the boy had just mentioned she was in the same class as Kim Hae-on. A wave of anger surged through him. Why would you leave out something so important until now? You know what you've done? You've committed perjury. I completely wait for this. I swear to swear to God, if you tell, tell me everything from now on, you're in deep shit. Were you in with Tae-rim that day? Were you with Tae-rim? Yes, the detective felt as though he'd been clobbered over the head. Why were you together? Because Tae-rim asked for a ride. Oh, what? Your scooter? On what, your scooter? Yes, you're killing me, Manu. Are you saying she was on your scooter with you? I thought you were going to, I mean, coming back from delivery. I was on my way back when I saw her on the street. She waved me over, so I pulled up. Then she asked for a ride. She said it was a, it was urgent. So when you two were on the scooter together, and that's when you saw Shin Jung Jun's car. I didn't even know it was his car, uh, his sister's car, I mean. Terim said his sister had just gotten it, but Jung, Jiang Jung was driving it around. She told me to get in front. In front? Yeah, when we stopped at the red light, she told me to get in front of it. In front of what? Jeon Jun's car. Why'd she say that? I don't know. So did you? Yep. The detective frustration built. The strange way the boy had of contradicting himself was getting on his nerves, and he found himself tripping over his own tongue. And then? So that's why. That's why what? That's why Tehran might have seen. Tehran might have seen. To the detective, these words would have sounded like a lie, but they confirmed the truth for me. Yoon Tae-rim would have wanted to know who was in the passenger seat of Shin Jeon Jun's car. She would have gotten on Han Manu's scooter, telling him to get in front of it. This detail contained a subtle truth the boy would never have been able to invent on his own. Why the hell didn't you mention this last time? Because I didn't think she liked it. Didn't like what? The scooter? What are you talking about? Tae-rim didn't like it. Come again? Riding the scooter? You're saying she didn't like riding your scooter? That's right. Why did you give her a ride then? Because she asked me. She was the one who waved me over. I never asked if she wanted a ride. You didn't ask her? Fine, but why would you give her a ride if she didn't want you to get on your scooter? Why do you say anything until now? You don't understand, mister. She never got on something like that. The detective felt as if he were about to lose his mind. Okay, let me get this straight. It's not that you didn't want to give Terry a ride, but she didn't like scooters and would never get on something like that. Is that what you're saying? 
She wouldn't be caught dead on a delivery scooter, so imagine how shocked I was when she asked for a ride. That she said she wanted to get off, so I dropped her off. That means she didn't like it, doesn't it? She asked you to drop her off right away. What was so urgent then? Urgent. She said she waved you over and asked for a ride because it was urgent. Oh, I didn't ask why. Was there ever such an idiot? The detective thought. A stupid detective would have figured it out, but if a girl was ashamed of being seen on a scooter, asked an idiot boy for a ride on his delivery scooter, and then tells him to pass Shinji on June's car, only to get off immediately, isn't the, isn't the reason obvious? She was simply trying to see who Shinji on June was with. After confirming my sister's presence in the car, Terim had promptly gotten off the scooter. What exactly had, had she seen at that moment? How beautiful my sister looked, how indifferent, how cruel. What exactly? So this is a sister talking about her sister. The detective, okay, she says, what exactly has she seen at that moment? How beautiful my sister looked, how indifferent, how cruel. <clears throat> the detective shook his head, his belief that his moron was guilty remained unshaken. He knew the boy was trying to take the negative attention off himself by dragging in a girl named Young, Yoon Tae-Rim, but he was just digging himself into a bigger hole. Han Manu, I know you're lying. I swear it's the truth, but I really have to go. You're lying 100%. You realize I'm going to bring Young Tae-Rim in for questioning, don't you? Before deciding to lie, you should have gotten your story straight. How in the world would, would Young Tae-Rim Tae Managed to see something you couldn't see. Let's say she saw Kim hae on in a tank top with her hair down. How could she have seen anything else? Is she taller than you? Even if she's taller, she still wouldn't have been able to see what Kim hae on was wearing on the bottom. It's physically impossible. I really gotta go, the boy says sullenly. You listening with your ass for the hundredth time from your crappy midget scooter. There's no way you could have seen Kim tae in shorts. Got that? All right. All right, that's all you have to say. Are you admitting you're wrong? No, but the detective leaned across the table, sensing that victory was at hand. Mister, could you not call it a midget scooter? The detective gave a humorous laugh. I'm going to ask you one last time, you're saying, since you saw Kim hae in shorts, you and Taylor must have seen too. Yes, I'll be looking into this. If it turns out you're lying, you're dead. Can I go now? You can go. Frowning, the detective watched the boy get up from his seat, bow, and make his way out of the interrogation room. His sneakers dragging along the floor, he would have fallen into thought then, tapping the documents on the table, lining up the corners and edges. I'm aware of this habit, just as I'm aware of his other habits of placing a stack of paper on the table and pressing it hard with the tip of his retracted pen, scattering the pages he had just straightened. Even now, I can recall his facial expressions and manner of speaking, his squat neck atop a stocky frame, which made him resemble a gorilla. Many times he had come to our apartment, and many times I'd gone to the station with my mother. I was describing the detective. That day, the detective would have weighed Han Manu's narrow, pinched face against Shin Jeon Jun's clean features, the former's cheap World Cup t-shirt against the latter's Ivy Club button-down shirt, a single mother against the accountant father, and the 20th rank in class against the top 10 of the entire grade, as well as the credibility of the witnesses providing the alibis. Rather than try to find the real culprit, the detective would have considered whom he could or should crush and turn to the culprit, and that's exactly what he tried to do. That day, the detective would have weighed Han Manu's narrow, pinched face against Shin, against Shin Jeon Jun's clean features, the former's cheap World Cup t-shirt against the latter's Ivy League Club button-down shirt. So he's just like, so he's comparing the two like lives at the time. The credibility of the witness providing the alibis, rather than try to find the real culprit. The detective would have considered whom he could or should crush and turn into the culprit. That's exactly what he tried to do. Crush and turn into the culprit. I've been constructing so I don't so it says that's exactly what he tried to do. So is he gonna is he gonna just pick someone he just thinks or so cause right here it says he would have just kinda made a prejudicism decision off of somebody who's a troublemaker already. Off of the person that was in the car with the girl. It was a good person. Uh, but they don't. They haven't said what he said about this incident. So, so now we're on the next. Like within the chapters, there's like spaces when it becomes like a different, um, different scene. Just so you could kind of know how we. It's, you could be like he's jumping back and forth from. So page nineteen, the bottom. I've been constructing this second interrogation in my mind for a long time. The way he might put Lego pieces together. How Manu was questioned a total of seven times, but it was this interview that hinted at the truth and the way the case would eventually unfold. Yet the strange thing was, each time I recreated the second interview, an excess of details would emerge as if small warped pieces of Legos, or as a small, as if small warped pieces of Lego were finding their way in somehow. This had nothing to do with how Manu or the detective. It was my problem. It happened again this time. I'd written that the detective, as he gazed at Hamanu's hand, thought a person doesn't need a whole lot of power to bash in the small head of a girl with smooth, glossy hair. Why is such an unnecessary detail intruded into the scene? A small head, fine, but hair that's smooth and glossy has no bearing on the way someone is struck. 
the detective would have never added such a useless detail while questioning the, sub uh, questioning the suspect. Uh, of course, my sister's dazzling beauty, clearly displayed even by her lifeless body, may have crossed his mind all of a sudden. It doesn't matter if you imagine these things or not. The problem is that this kind of excess keeps slipping into the imagined scene. What I've done is project my own thoughts and desires onto the detective. Does this mean I'm still not free? That I'm not free? Not one iota from those smooth, fair, relevant details from 16 years ago? Those endless memories of my sister's loveliness, which had made me undergo plastic surgery, turning my own face into a crude patchwork of her features? It's true, my sister was beautiful unforgettably so she was perfection bliss personified but more than anything she was at the mythical age 18 who dared destroy her lovely form was it hamanu shinji arjun or a third figure now i know not who killed my sister but who didn't no that's not true i know who the murderer is that's why i did what i did and i know i'll never be free from this crime until the day i die i hear my mother's voice and a child laughing the child's laugh rings like a bell announcing my guilt. Soon this child will enter elementary school and I'll become a school parent. Before June of my 16th year, I never imagined I'd be living this way. Not once had I desired this kind of life, yet here I am. What meaning then could life possibly hold? I didn't desire such a life for myself, but at the same time, I can't say I didn't choose. Not, not once had I, had I desired this kind of life, yet here I am. What meaning then could life possibly hold? I didn't desire such a life for myself, but at the same time, I can't say I didn't choose it. Never my mother's voice. Never my mother's voice and a child laugh, and the child laugh rings like a bell announcing my guilt. So this child will enter elementary school and I'll become a school parent. So that sounds like this is the sister of the of the beautiful girl she got killed. And maybe she sounded like she's guilty at the end right here. Alright, so that's the end of the first chapter, which is called Shorts. This book is pretty interesting. It's not that long, you know. <laughs>